Okay, that should be about it. Give me just a second to verify. Okay, hey everybody, it's Uncle Grumpy and welcome to Grumpy Tonight. As you can see, I'm here tonight with Dr. Lawrence Pasternak. We are going to pick up where we left off the other day by going over some of the currently filed bills. Uh, Lawrence, you wanted to start by saying something about this afternoon's post. Yeah, I'm just um, opening up um, this video so I can see comments. I'll do that in a second. <clears throat> um, it seems that there was a lot of frustration about the post that was put up earlier. Um, there was a table on it that compared 788 to various um, model options for alternative programs. And um, uh, it was being created for tonight's show and I think that there was just a lack of context around it and people didn't understand it, understood it as intended. So I'm, I apologize. I didn't, didn't occur to me that, that it would be construed in the way that it was. Um, we're gonna give all that context tonight. And so we'll, we'll get to that table and we'll get to all the, the issues related to it. So that's a sort of what I wanted to say in the beginning and I'll pass it back over to you, Chris. Okay, well then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm looking forward to jumping back into these bills we were going over the other day. We, were, uh, we took our time on the first half of the list and therefore we had to rush through the second half. This time I'd kind of like to take a harder look at the second half uh, for example, I know there's a bill from uh, Representative Townsley uh, mm -hmm. that restricts where dispensaries can be located. Um, I wouldn't mind starting with something like that. And as you said, those that are interested in discussing this full access bill that's caused a little bit of scuttlebutt today, uh, we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. So, Lawrence, go ahead. You, you've got sharing uh, capability there if you want to put something up on the screen. Okay, so... Um... Let me screen share here. And um, I imagine you all could see it. This is just a list of all the bills that uh, were filed for this session that have the word marijuana in it. And we went over these uh, in, a, in sort of a quick form on, on Friday. Um, the ones that say N slash A, those are ones where the word marijuana appears, but not in any newer or mandatory content. It just happens to be some, the word marijuana appears somewhere else from previous year's legislation. Uh, the ones that say shell, as you would assume, are just shell bills. There's no real content yet. Um, and then uh, Scott Fedgetter has refiled 3228, and it's going to be substantially uh, revised. So Durbin and Fedgetter both said just no need to talk about that one because the language that's there right now is going to be thoroughly changed. Well, hold more. on one second. Hold on one second. I do want to point out to everybody when it says shell, he's right. It means there's not language yet, or at least it's not ready to be published yet. You're still working it out. Uh, sometimes the language is published and then there's still amendments to be made. So just because there's language doesn't mean it's written in stone yet. And, and when it says shell, what you can usually do is um, figure out what it's from, for, what it's going to affect by the title, or at least that's the closest you can get is by the title. It usually has something to do with whatever the bill is going to cover. Go ahead. Yeah, so that was something I was going to, we'll get to this again, but something I was going to bring up related to uh, 1961, um, which is that whenever a bill is introduced, that doesn't mean that's what its final form is. And um, the table basically indicated that there were various things that were probably going to be changed. And I had conversations, like I said, with Durbin, I had conversations with Fetgetter about, about that bill after it got filed. And there's lots of changes that are intended. So that's not the final form, but we'll get, we'll get back to that. So um, House Bill uh, 2012 uh, by uh, Representative Tammy Townley that's just a shell bill, there's no content. 
Um, and I was uh, shown an exchange by Teresa Tehran and Representative Townley that did indicate to us what the content, what the plan content was from Representative Townley. And basically the plan content was uh, to push dispensaries farther away uh, from schools and from daycares and so on. So, so doesn't this add, isn't the plan to add daycares and, uh, and shop, I guess just daycares to the list, to the school list? Yeah. Okay. So, right. So dispensaries can not be near K through 12 schools and they want to add in um, daycares. And so one of the potential consequences of that, if you're looking at a small town in particular, is that the built up area of a small town could be very, very minimal. And so if there's like just a little town, you know, a couple cross streets that are, that are in the center of town, and that's about all there is for the built up area, if there is a um, if there is a daycare in that area, then if Representative Townley bill gets turned into law, then it's very, very possible that those small towns won't even be able to have a dispensary. So um, this is something certainly of concern. Um, but, right, the language isn't there yet, the details aren't there, and then we could also hopefully expect that that's not a bill that will uh, get out of committee and that's not a bill that will get to the floor for a well, vote. Hopefully, I wanna point out on here, I should have said this earlier and Beverly's pointed this out, share this video, more need to get, uh, and maybe more will get involved. So again, everybody please share this video. Uh, we're just here to bring it to your attention. It's gonna take everybody to uh, have any influence on any of these. Okay, go ahead, Lawrence. Um, Denise Ellis, I'm just looking at the comments here. Denise Ellis says, wait, do we have this law for pharmacies? I guess, I guess the question is, do we have law that distances pharmacies from various schools and so on? No, you know, there isn't that kind of restriction. And obviously that's one of the reasons why we're concerned about this because cannabis is medical and this is a medical program and it should be treated as medicine and it should not be stigmatized. So, you know, this is obviously part of our part of our big fight here, that it's not basically forced into the dark corners beyond where anybody could see it. Um, okay, so now let me move on to House Bill uh, 2812 from Sneed. Isn't there a, um, a Harry Potter character called Sneed? Yes, I think else? there is. All right. So um, I do not know whether or not there is any relation. I'm making a joke. Um, I don't even know exactly who Sneed is in, in, in Facebook. It doesn't sound like a very friendly character. Or, I mean, no, I, I don't think uh, so, but I, I don't remember either. So uh, this is very disturbing, what Sneed is proposing here. Basically, what he wants to do is make it unlawful for businesses to use cash with one another. So a dispensary cannot use cash to make purchases from a grower or from a processor. A processor cannot use cash to make purchases from a grower and so on. Um, Representative Sneed wants to, instead of using legal tender and, you know, it's, it even lists, right, not just the United States, but currencies from any country. So they can't use Canadian currency or Mexican currency or whatever and instead use these uh, performance bonds that would then be issued, presumably with fees tied to it, by insurance companies, giving insurance companies a nice little secondary stream of income. And, you know, a lot of people have concerns about, right, the replacement of cash with digital currencies and so forth, and the extent to which that could be tracked and monitored by the government. And it's taking away from our liberty. So this is just, you know, one of those kinds of terrifying thoughts that the government might want to have even greater control right over our lives and prevent the use of currency for what at least in the in Oklahoma and in what is it now 36 other states what is perfectly lawful and presumably at the federal level will soon I hope become lawful as well. So that's yeah. just you know a, a weird weird right um move you know i i, I want to point something out i've noticed that i thought was somewhat strange 
Um, since the beginning of this program, I've talked, as everybody knows, to a lot of business owners. And one thing, theme that keeps coming up, and I've seen many say they were going to do it, and that is to try and switch over to cryptocurrency. They talk about getting their patients to sign up for this cryptocurrency where you would buy money then so you'd have a card. It was a way to get the card. All these problems could be solved if our federal government could just get out of the way. It's just I've heard some of the craziest ideas. Now, these performance bonds, again, as you pointed out, nothing more than an attempt to grab more people's money. Mm. I mean, I'm sure they could justify it by saying they could track everything better, but they're not doing that for free. So this is definitely a bad idea. Yeah, and I, I, I would think that part of the reason why as well is so that they could monitor transactions to make sure that everybody is complying with various laws and preventing you know, some kind of right, questionable use of funds as part of a cannabis exchange or make sure that all the taxes are being paid. So there may be you know, other, other purposes there, but you know, personally, it, I find it kind of a, a scary thing. Okay, go ahead. All right. So next one, um, next one is Senate Bill 445 uh, by Representative Paxton. And so I'm going to open that one up. Um, I'm not quite sure what people see, whether they see the original page with the long list or this new bill, but I'm just opening it up. Opening no, it up. we're not seeing the bill. We're still seeing the original list. It's not switching over. I think uh, so let yeah, me just, you have to do that and share again. Here. Right. Uh, um, I think this will do it. All right, how's that? That's it. Okay. So uh, this bill by Senator Paxton uh, deals with quite an array of things, um, smoking in public areas and so forth. But then finally, when you get down uh, towards the bottom of it, let me find it here. Um, what we see is the addition of language that says, in addition to any other penalties provided by law, penalties for sale by a medical marijuana business and so forth. So what this is doing is the following, that cur currently businesses, medical marijuana businesses are protected from uh, certain types of criminal jeopardy. So let's say for instance, um, I'll just give you the example. Let's say you are a lawful medical marijuana patient. You're 20 years old. You have a younger brother who's 17 years old or something like that. He steals your ID, he steals a driver's license, and he steals your patient card. You look an awful like that he could pass for you. And he goes to a dispensary and he buys cannabis using your ID. Right now, that kind of act is potentially just a, a finable offense. But what this bill would do by Senator Paxton it is that in addition to it being a final bull offense, the, the, the business would be punishable by all the existing criminal penalties so that it would basically become a, um, a felony distribution. Um, so what would be otherwise just a, an infraction for a business that could be fined, he wants to make it into felony distribution. And wow. so and that, that has implications that go far beyond just this, because as we're all going to eventually be talking about, we know eventually we're going to get around to a full access program. If we have a law like that sitting around and then we get to the point where people can buy with just their driver's license to show their age, then what are we going to have? We're going to have people doing like they do with the alcohol and tobacco sales. They're going to be trying to set stores up to see if they're making illegal sales, only in this case, it's not going to be a fine. When you get caught, it's going to be a felony. Yeah. So hopefully, again, this is one of those that won't get out of committee. Um, it, it covers so many different topics all, all in one bill. It violates single subject, and presumably it's not going to move forward. Um, but we, you know, sometimes when we look at these bills, what we're getting a sense of is um, where particular lawmakers stand and what they're willing to try to do to get their way. So, you know, but the way I look at it, Lawrence, when yeah. these first bills are filed, yeah. is what we see is, is what groups are supporting what lawmakers. Because the first initial ideas that they're putting forward 
are about as close to what the constituent or the lobbyist or whoever is asking for that they could get away with. Yeah. So well, that's our this is, as well. so this is what's being asked of him. Mm. And again, this is not in stone. This is language. As Lawrence has said, this may not make it out of committee. So there's no reason to go off on Paxton or Fett Getter or Townsley or anybody else, but there's always room reason to be concerned about these bills and to get involved. Yeah, that, that's a fair point. You know, I do not know Paxton well, and I don't know ultimately where he stands on matters. So it might be that he was asked to do this by a constituent. I, I've saying, got, I got to know Paxton fairly well last year. Well, no, I wouldn't say fairly well, but I got to know Paxton a little bit. Um, not last year because the pandemic. I only saw him a couple of times. But uh, the, the year before that, I got to know him a lot. I spent quite a bit of time coming in and out of his office and talking to him about a variety of things. And I always felt I could have an open, honest conversation with him. And I always felt like he was doing the same with me. So I did learn to respect him a lot. Um, I'm a little surprised, but then again, not knowing he's also the one who put forward the idea originally in, in what, 1030, that would have originally made it where uh, law enforcement got uh, the, the list, the patient card list. So, you know, there's some confliction there. So we certainly need to uh, get to know him a little bit better. Yeah. All right. Um, so let me just pause for a minute here uh, for everybody watching right now. If there's any of the other, any other bills you'd like uh, us to go over, uh, let me share that page again. Um, if there's any other bills you'd like us to go over before we get on to the full access petition, um, uh, mention it in the comments. And uh, by the way, all of this is on the OKCLA website under our current issues. You'll be able to find all, you'll be able to find this list of bills and the, uh, the bill numbers are all hypertext. So uh, depending on the browser, some people tell me if they click it in their browser, it'll go to the bill. Sometimes they say they have to download the PDF in order for the hypertext to work. But I, I, I tried to make the most comprehensive and complete list I could for anybody who wants to go through these things and explore them. I know that um, uh, Daryl Carnes raised an issue with uh, House Bill 1054 and concerning the tax on vape devices that, that this bill would create a 44% tax on the, uh, on the wholesale price of the electronic device, the vape device. So your, your mod or whatever they call it, the box that has the battery and the, um, uh, the container for the vape oil, uh, they want to, this proposal is 44%, uh, which is just crazy. And what'll, what'll happen is people just buy, buy, the, buy the mods online as opposed to a local store. So um, any other bills, I see Pamela wants us to get to 1961. Any other bills? Um, I've been checking around on Facebook to see what other discussions there are. Um, and honestly, a lot of them I think are good, right? A lot of them are good. Um, removing, uh, allowing vets to make recommendations for animals, um, allowing drive-throughs. That, that so one's on. just, I, I got to say though, the vet one, we have to stop for a second. Uh, that one's just fun to make jokes with. Yeah. I mean, come on. It's just, I mean, I want to know what picture you're putting on the card because I know my dog will pose for a camera. Everybody's seen her. So I'm sure she wants to be on her card, but does that mean she then goes to the store? I yeah. mean, it's just too much to do with this. And, and somebody posted, made a good point. Somebody made a good point that if you have multiple pets, do you have to get a separate card for each pet? Right. Yeah, that was uh, Deb Holden mentioned yeah. that. She said she wants one for all of her horses, and that's yeah. reasonable to me. Yep. And I'll take a look. I, I forget the language, with it, which way it goes on that, but I'll bring this up with Pet Getter, or Deb could bring it up with Pet Getter. It's something okay. certainly worth considering, especially since the price is still going to be $100 for it. Yeah, I'll look for more puns and other fun innuendos I can throw oh, in there. Oh, your, your pet has game. to be 21 in dog years. This is true. This yeah. is true. <laughs> okay, okay. Right. all right so, what about puppies what about the puppies you're leaving out the puppies lawrence well you know you you need the recommendation from two vets then you need a oh. pediatric vet okay two vet two vets for a puppy all right that makes sense i can oh. see that all see, right. we're just having okay. some fun here guys come on lighten up <laughs> all right 
So shall we move on to um, 1961? Yes, I think we will. But before we do, okay. I want to say again, all of these bills we're talking about are first files, okay? None of these are written in stone. None of them are out of committee. None of them are worth burning the house down yet. All of them are worth paying attention to. All of them are looking into and trying to figure out intent. Again, like I said earlier, I see these as uh, not just a way to see how the legislators might position themselves individually, but I look at it to see who's pushing those uh, legislators, um, who's pushing their agenda, because I can assure you there's somebody pushing everyone's agenda. And if we knew who they were, sometimes it helps figure it out and maybe it helps us find a happy medium. So please pay attention to all the bills, but don't freak out over any of them yet. We're just getting started, folks. We got a long way to go. Yeah, and you know, relatedly, I just I just hope people are mindful about this. Um, I just, you know, Facebook can be such a toxic place. You know, we probably have all encountered just a lot of mean-spirited, nasty exchanges on Facebook. We're all human beings, we're not just text on a screen. And I, I kind of think that just a lot of people, you know, living in Oklahoma under a life of prohibition has caused a kind of trauma. And people, you know, people are triggered and people, you know, are quick to anger and people are suspicious. And while, you know, suspicion, I think is a good thing. There's a difference between suspicious and you want to find out what's going on before you come to any conclusion or just immediately assuming the worst. And I just, it's just sad to me that people, people tend to, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people will jump to the worst case scenario. So maybe, you know, it's the Canadian me, even though I'm a complainer too, that, that I, I, try, I try to be nice and I try to try to think about the best case, best, you know, who that person is at their best and try to, you know, try to understand what their worries are in a fair way. So, you know, I, I'm sorry that this, that this got out the way it did without context. Um, and with, with, with that being, being said, now, you know, let me bring up this chart again. We have context and, you know, let's, let's try to see, find the best in all of us and realize that we all pretty much here share the same goal. We want everybody to have legal access to cannabis where they're not gonna be facing anything that's gonna hurt them, endanger their lives, not gonna make things worse for anybody and so on. And I, and, I, and I realized that some people, when they looked at this chart, thought that 1961 was being, was being filed to replace 788. So that's just one of those things where it's like, that's not at all the case, right? The, the discussion on Friday that where we brought it up, and now again, we're going to talk about it. The point is not to take anything away, not to take away 788, just obviously, like with 806 and 807. It was meant got the medical program here, but then you have something else for people who aren't going to be part of the medical program. And, you know, let me, let me just bring up this as well. Let me just find. And I want to say again, we even know that, uh, that not exactly which ones, but there are some changes already in mind for this. So as I keep saying, none of this is written in stone. These are all first files. Uh, we have to work through them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm kind of belaboring all these preliminaries, but take a look, right? Here's, here's the marijuana arrest data uh, from 2018 and 2019. Um, and, you know, the, the OSBI has arrest data from 2020 as well that will be soon uh, made public. We have thousands of people in this state who are continuing to be arrested for simple possession, right? These numbers here are numbers where the arrest was only possession or where somebody had, you know, it, this was the possession was the reason for the arrest, the major infraction that triggered the arrest, right? It could have been a traffic stop where they found the cannabis or whatever. These are not numbers where they arrest somebody for assault and they find cannabis or whatever on them. These are yeah. numbers where people are getting arrested for cannabis possession. 
Yeah, I want to say, know, look, I want to say when Lawrence first put this, when Lawrence first got this information and put this out, we didn't know what other charges were involved. That would seem to be the question everybody had at the time was they wanted to see the rest of the arrest report, maybe to try and figure out what the justification. So Lawrence went back to the people that came up with all this information and he verified that it was the worst charge that they were uh, uh, being arrested for at that time. So yeah. it, it, it was it's yeah. as bad as it looks, but go ahead. As, you know, as did Representative Fetgetter as well, right? When I, when I told them that these are numbers, right, that reflect the, the, the possession arrest, right? Not something else that just happened to involve possession. And the, I got this data from the Oklahoma Policy Institute who got this from the OSBI. And so Fetgetter contacted the OSBI to confirm. And sure enough, that's what that data means. So we have thousands of people each year still continuing to get arrested, disproportionately black. It's like 27% of all the arrests are of, of black Oklahomans. So one of the things that motivates, one of the things that's behind 1961 is we don't want anybody to continue on to be arrested. Right? Hold on, hold on. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I want to clarify the number you just said, 27%. It's, it's important to point out only 7% of the population uh, of Oklahoma is black and studies show that use among blacks and whites is the same percentage wise. So because I know that's where everybody's going to wonder where the differences might be. Yeah. That's it. That's all the facts. Go yeah. ahead. So, um, and it would be a misdemeanor charge and misdemeanors will mean for people, you can't get a student loan when you're employed as a background check, you might not get the job or you might be fired when a landlord does a background check, right? You might not get your lease. It could change the insurance rates for your car. If this involves a cannabis in a vehicle, you can get your driver's license suspended. Um, it could be an additive charge for any further crimes. There's court costs and fees and so forth that go along with it. It could be probo probation violations, et cetera. So, you know, I don't, I don't sort of take a misdemeanor and just think, oh, it's just a no, misdemeanor, no. For people having a misdemeanor charge is the difference between getting a job and not getting a job, getting an apartment and not getting a, an apartment, staying out of jail and not staying out of jail. Yeah. Basically. And if look, if you walk that all the way through, we all know about enhanced set sentencing after uh, the attempt uh, of 805 to pass this summer. <clears throat> and, and so that misdemeanor, that one time possession later on is now you're a repeat offender. And so what was that one time minor thing has now snowballed, like Lawrence has said, not only into all the, the services you can be denied, but you can also be then become, by the time it's all said and done, a ward of the state. You could end up in jail before this is all over because that is just one more thing for them to use to, to enhance your sentence for whatever else they might have you for. Right. Next so, time. right. So there, there are other people in conversation with Representative Fetketter over all of this. And Ron Durbin, you know, likewise has been talking about the possibility of having something like full access for just about as long as we have as well, longer, longer in a way since, you know, he, what was, what was the name of the, the Green the Vote full access? 797. 797. So, you know, it's, it's been part of the conversation you know, right from the inception of 788. So let me actually open up the bill, 1961, and we could we can talk through it. Hello, computer. I'm waiting for it to show up. There it is. Okay. I first saw. 1961 after it was filed and as i was looking through it and started to see problems with it i spoke with uh representative fetgetter i spoke with ron durbin and pretty much every time i said this is a concern of mine this is something that i'm worried about the response was we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it we'll, we'll we'll look at it we'll come up with something better and so it this was they were rushed to get everything out. They were rushed to get everything filed by the deadline. And they knew that this, like many other bills, are a work in progress, like the omnibus is a work in progress. 
And so none of the language here is finalized language. And so a reason why I created this table and a reason why we did the show Friday, and the reason why we're doing a show today is because we want people to be part of this conversation, right? Because I'm not gonna spot everything and Chris is not gonna spot everything. And so other eyes on it will be helpful. So, you know, Durbin's name was formally listed at the top with Brett Getter's name, with the thought was, they're the people most likely who would be able to put in the language to get it changed. And I think that that's still the case. So we will see things that need to be changed and we'll talk about them. Now, okay, let me move forward. I'm gonna just skip over the definitions. Hopefully there's nothing there that, that's, that, that is that big of a deal. And this kind of go over sort of the, the core meat and potatoes here. Um, this is a bill for individuals 21 and over, right? Doesn't, doesn't change anything regarding 788. If you're 18 and you have a medical card, you can still use, you can still purchase cannabis. If you're under 18, you know, with the pediatric card, you can still use cannabis. But this is for people who don't want to get a card. Everybody could get a card, presumably, but some people don't want to get a card for various reasons, right? They don't want to get a, on a government list, right? Or, you know, they might say, let me at least try cannabis. They maybe they've never tried it or not since they were a teenager. Let me at least try it before I get a card. Or there's various other reasons why people just may not want to get a card. They might say, I use it so infrequently. Why should I spend $150 to get a card? Physician and then, then your own well, look, card. Let, let me let me say this. This is relevant, okay? And I say this from firsthand experience. I'm not saying what somebody told me. I'm saying what happened to me. I worked my way up to almost 10,000 pharmaceutical drugs a year, all prescribed by my doctor. I was at the end of my rope. I went to my doctor and said, I have to stop taking all these and I'm going to try something different. And over time, my doctor watched me get healthy. He continued to test me for THC. And for four years, he allowed me to test positive. And he said, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. At the end of all my meetings, uh, um, the nurse would be asked to leave the room and he and I would talk about my cannabis use. One week after I got my card, they called me and sent a uh, an assistant in to tell me they would never write a prescription for me again because I got my card. So um, a full access program gives options, okay? I could have kept that doctor by simply not getting my card. Now that would have been a bad move. I would have been breaking the law by using it or continuing to break the law by using it at that point. And I didn't want to do that anymore. That was part of the reason why I was helping to fight for 788. I didn't want to be illegal anymore. But my doctor said, if you're going to do that, if you're going to get a card, I'm done with you. And that's happened to thousands of people, some of which have called Lawrence and I when they're at the end of their rope and the gun is literally at their head. So that's one reason why we have been encouraging full access since uh, the first set of rules, which took away a lot of the patient protections, in our opinion. Yeah. And, you know, I, I also just... 15 states around the country have full access now, right? Hardly are we the vanguard for any of this. And, you know, states like South Dakota, right, this year passed full access, jumping in a sense right over medical. They said yes to both full access and medical at the same time. My assumption has been for, you know, for a number of years that federal law is going to be changing quite quickly. I didn't expect it to happen under Trump. It didn't happen under Trump. My expectation was, was that if a Democrat takes over in the White House, it's going to happen. So I kind of still expect that. We know that Biden is not as cannabis friendly as some of the other Democrats are. But, you know, by the way, there was actually a, a bill filed already uh, for rescheduling by a Republican. So a Republican in Congress, in U.S. Congress, has already filed a bill to change cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. And that's where the Republican is, right? So the Democrats, I imagine, are going to be changing, changing uh, cannabis law, hopefully this year. And so whatever we do in our state, right, th this bill, right, that we're talking about here is not supposed to even come into effect until 2023. My guess is, is that federal law is going to change before that. Let me go on. So one ounce or less of marijuana. So if you are a cardholder, you're still allowed up to eight ounces at home. You're allowed to grow and so forth. But for those people who don't want a card, for somebody who presumably is just an occasional user or whatever, they're allowed to possess up to one ounce. And that was one of the things that I talked to Fetgetter about. And I said, maybe that's too low. 
And my hope ultimately is, is that whether it's full access or not, that there's really no difference between what people could use medically, what the limits that are available for medical and the limits that are available for everybody. But this is just where the conversation, where the numbers began, one ounce, which is not uncommon for other states. And so the main point here is somebody who is an occasional user is probably not gonna have more than one ounce at their time. If law enforcement stops them, there's nothing illegal about what they're doing, right? Nobody goes to jail anymore. Nobody gets a misdemeanor offense. All right, next one is, and this was something that immediately bothered me and I talked to Fetgetter about, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't see my concern at first, and then I showed him the language, and as soon as I showed him the language, he said, yep, that's got to change. And so consumption of marijuana, provided that nothing um, in this section shall permit consumption that is conducted openly. So it legalizes consumption so long as it's not open, so long that it's not public or in a manner that endangers others. So I said, what about, what about if you're sitting on your front porch and you're smoking a joint, right? That's public and open, people will see you use it. It might be on your person, pers private property, but people will still see you. And Fetgetter's response was, you're right, we gotta fix it. I think I mentioned it to Durbin as well, and he, he concurred as well. So, you know, we don't want to make it unlawful for somebody to sit on the front porch and smoke a joint. And I said, well, what about this one? What about somebody who's in a, who's in a movie theater or whatever and takes a gummy? That would also be illegal according to this. And they didn't want that either. So the language, here is, is intended to change. Um, next, uh, for purposes of privacy, uh, when you make a transaction with a dispensary, you don't have to show them, there's no patient card, right? There's no cannabis user card or anything like that. They don't have to retain any kind of record whatsoever related to your transaction, right? You can walk in, Pay by cash. Well, show them you have a, you know, you're 18, you're 21 or older. They don't need to record anything to prove that you're 21 or, or older. You give them your cash and you walk out. No record whatsoever of your purchase, with the exception of maybe if there's a, a camera that has your face, so you wear dark sunglasses if, if you so need to. And so right now, right, all of your purchases, right, there's a digital, there's a digital trail, right, for all of your purchases as a patient. And this enhances privacy. This gives people who are worried, people who for one reason or another are worried about it ever getting up publicly that they're using cannabis. Then this allows people to make cash purchases, no record of their purchase that has to do with any identifying information. So again, full access solves a problem with the medical program. Yeah. Just thought I'd now, throw that in. Now, the tax is going to be an excise tax of 15%. And, you know, a lot of people don't like that, you know, the sin tax, and it's a greater tax for cannabis than for any ordinary thing. Um, I'm sympathetic with that concern. I would sort of, I would like the idea, one idea that I had was to have the existing 7% tax for those without a card and then use that to pay for the program so that cannabis, so people with cards pay 0%. And by the way, 7% for a medical program is actually quite high, right? A lot of yes. medical programs yes. don't have an excise tax or just have, right. a, have an excise tax of a couple percent. So 7% right. excise tax is actually quite high. Yeah, that's the problem. And people think we have the, the cheapest medical tax in the state or in the country. No, we have the cheapest rec taxes if, if, if that's what it was, but it's not what it's supposed to be. So we actually have high taxes. Um, I think I'm my concern about the 15% is that we're not done yet. What I mean by that is like you just pointed out, there might be some, it's, it's more than likely that there'll be some changes at the federal level. It's more than likely that's going to come with a tax. So therefore, if it's 15 plus standard sales tax, we're, we're getting up between 23 and 25, depending on where in the state you are. And then you throw on another, what was the last word in the Moore Act? Wasn't it around 8% or is it still at five? Yeah, so the, right, so the Moore Act, which passed the House last year, it's not a live bill anymore since this is a new Congress, but right. the, the Moore Act was starting at five, going up to 8%. But, okay. but I, I don't know if it's more than likely that there'll be a, a federal tax, there may or may not be, but 
I think that as well, under this, under you know, democratic control of Congress, we might see cannabis rescheduled as well. So one possibility is that they move cannabis from schedule one to schedule three, and then they let states, if they want, have recreational programs. And so if cannabis is moved from schedule one to schedule three, then that could provide a, an environment in which there could be no tax on medical and there would only be a tax on rec. So the MORE Act won't necessarily tax medical use. The MORE Act might merely tax uh, non-medical, recreational use. We'll see, right? We'll just have to see how all of this plays out. Okay, and the bigger right. our medical program, the higher they're gonna want that rec tax to be to make up the difference. That could be. Um, so this doesn't resolve anything concerning driving. Nothing in this act shall be construed to allow driving under the influence of marijuana. That doesn't mean there's not gonna be a fix, but it's just not part of this legislation. Uh, nothing in this act shall require an employer to permit accommodation uh, or permit or, or accommodate conduct otherwise allowed by this act. So there's no necessary fix with regards to employment that may or may not get a fix, but it's not part of this act. There doesn't, there's, there aren't protections with regards to parents. There aren't protections with regards to parolees. On that table, I listed lots of things that this act doesn't include, but that doesn't mean that they don't get included either in this legislation or in future legislation. It's just basically, here's the territory, here's the landscape that we're now looking at so that we can have a conversation about what's missing and what's needed. And let's look at the time frame of the layout of this particular bill. If this gets, its, gets through the House and the Senate, which we hear it has a pretty slim chance, but if it does, then the governor still has to sign it and agree to put it on the ballot next year. It doesn't become the law. We still have to vote on it. All they are doing is going to give us the vote on it. Uh, basically, yeah, they're, saving the us, they're saving us from writing the petition and collecting the signatures. The problem there is that they then get to set the rules. So that's, that's a problem. That's a concern. Look, I, I realize this bill is not final language. I keep saying that, but it's also important that we, we try and make it the best it can possibly be so that if any other problems come down the road, we have a safety net. My concern is tightening up of the medical program down the road and some of us that are currently on the medical program ending up on the recreational program. That's a legitimate concern. I'm not trying to send off alarms. That's a legitimate concern. So I want to make sure this rec program is as easy as possible. I'd like to see everybody have the same rights. You said it yourself. You don't want the card to be anything more than a tax differential. Me too. I don't want the card to be whether or not you go to jail. So, you know, we've got to all get involved. We've got to work on this. Yeah. Something to bear in mind is that this is the, 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 the adult use program laid out in this bill. It's not that our lawmakers are going to be voting for or against adult use. They're going to be voting for or against whether or not to put a ballot right. question on a future election that we will then vote on with regards to adult use. Yeah, in 2023 right. sometime, we would vote on this. That's a long so way down the- 2022, what? we would vote. Oh, Presumably I'm sorry, 2022, we'd vote on it. I'm sorry, 2022, we would vote on it. January 1st of 2023, two years from now is when this would start. That's the dates. That's the So, you know, if we do vote on it, it might be during the primaries of 20. 2022. It might turn be the November election of 2022. If it, you know, if it gets passed, then it wouldn't start until January of 2023, uh, almost two years away from now. So one of the other aspects of all of this is that right now there's 365,000 or so card holders. Some card holders presumably buy for other people. It's hard to say exactly how many cannabis users there are in the state. It might be, I've heard people say there's two people using or three people using for every card i don't know but this could increase sales it could help dispensaries who are struggling have more uh patrons and so on it may be that lawmakers from more conservative rural counties might 
request that there be an opt out. Um, so if this gets passed, they might have a bill like in many other recreational states where they can't do away with medical, but a county could opt out of um, out of recreational. So we isn't, don't isn't have, that isn't honestly, that how it was in eight oh seven? Didn't eight oh seven give an opt out? 807 gave an opt out. 807 uh, made it possible for rural counties uh, to say, we'll allow there to be rec uh, medical, but no recreational. And so there's other options too. It could just be that they allow everybody recreational if, they're, if they have an Oklahoma ID, right? I, so they just might not address, want traffic from Texas and so on. I want to address my reasons for wanting the home grow for everyone. Uh, again, I don't want the card to be a deciding factor in whether or not you go to jail. I don't want law enforcement knocking on my door and asking if I have a card. And if I do, making a note of that and writing my address down. If I don't, what, arresting me? That's a concern of mine. And as far as the concern about that suddenly feeding the black market, I just would say that let's take a look at what we have right now. We have more commercial businesses feeding the black market then home grows. We're not hearing anything about home grows feeding the black market. And the percentage of people that grow now, I believe is a smaller percentage of people that would grow under a rec program because under that rec program, that's as Lawrence has said, brings in the people that don't use very often and things like that. People who aren't putting that effort into it. They're certainly not going to put that effort into growing it to the black market. It just doesn't make sense to think that allowing everyone to grow will suddenly flood the market. The, again, the businesses in and out of the state flood the market more than the home grow. Go ahead. Yeah, and I, I just, you know, I tend to think, and obviously this was a mistake that I made with regards to how people responded to 806 and 807 was, I tend to think that federal law is gonna change soon. And so when we're talking about things like 806, 807, would not have even come into effect until 2023 as well, right? That there wouldn't be sales from dispensaries until 2023, like, like this one. And my thought is, it's like, whatever we're doing with any kind of adult use bill, it's, it's, it's just so provisional by comparison to how the world's gonna change when, when you know, assuming that I'm right, that federal law changes you know, within the year, maybe next year, but I'm kind of expecting this year. That, Which that, is all the more reason to, to have it an open program, a more relaxed program on the rec side because of those changes. Why do we want to end up with something tighter than what the federal government comes down with? Yeah. You know, and, you know, that was, you know, part of, part of my mistake. It's something that I, that I, I really believe should change and could have potentially changed with, you know, with, uh, 806 and 807 and something that I said should change is because that one was a constitutional amendment it should have a grandfather clause in it so that all these provisions change when federal law changes and that was a problem of course with 806 and 807 that it was constitutional and it did not have that grandfather clause which then would have required that there be another petition or there be a referendum by the legislature that we would vote on that would then have to fix it so this is obviously easier to address when federal law changes, right? Because it's just a statutory, right? It's a statute as opposed to a constitution. But maybe, you know, maybe I'm just being too wishful thinking here, but I'm just expecting that we're going to see either an executive order coming from Biden that's gonna reschedule cannabis, which effectively he could do. He could, he could order HHS and the AG to make that change or we're going to see um, the House introduce something like the Moore Act again, the Senate pass it or something similar. And then, you know, Biden presumably will be part of that negotiation. So, and, and you know, again, I want to say that, look, I want to point, I want to stop you there that again, if, if that happens, that's more tax that will be added. So again, not only is this bill not written in stone yet, so it's nothing to freak out about right now, but, uh, whatever taxes we try, we write, or they write, or whoever writes in a bill to, to put on a rec program, or even the medical program, perhaps, it could be affected very soon by whatever the federal government does. Yeah. I'm going to put up that table so we could talk through it. And okay. 
uh, again, you know, uh, apologies that this was misconstrued, that people didn't understand the context for it. The context was basically this conversation that we're having now, that <clears throat> 1961 doesn't remove 788, doesn't replace 788. It's there for people who don't want to get a card. And it's meant so that nobody goes to jail and nobody gets a misdemeanor. And so when it doesn't include something like I list here, protections for parental rights, no. Protections for parole or probation, no. Protections for people with public benefits, no. It doesn't include any of those. And in conversations with Fed Getter, he thought that that it's possible at least that the protections right now related to 788 could automatically carry over to 1961. I'm not sure if that's so, but if that isn't so, then the then Fetgetter's intention is to include language in an update for 1963, 1961 to make sure that all those protections are available for all cannabis users. So when I list these things as no, I'm just saying we got to be mindful of what 1961 looks like now and make sure that these other concerns get addressed. And ultimately, I have here on the far right a kind of aspirational approach. My thought is that one, one option is to, to take our existing program and simply write into statute card optional, right? If you, if you have the card, it is as it is. If you don't have the card, you pay a different tax rate. That difference could be that it'll, the taxes on the rec on the non-card holder to then pay for all the taxes that currently the card holder is paying. Maybe we have 7% if you don't have a card and 0% if you do have a card. Maybe it'll be 12% and 3%, I don't know. But what I was thinking was, and I think I was in sync with Durbin on this from conversations, was that the only difference that there should be between what we have now and a full access program is a difference at the cash register. And that was a problem with 806 and 807 that it took me a couple days to recognize that by having different licensing fees for recreational, then that could hurt medical businesses. Imagine if the fee for recreational was $50,000. Then you as a dispensary, if you can't pay that $50,000, you're limited just to medical, a smaller number of patrons, you could get competed out. With 1961, presumably nothing like that's going to happen. It'll simply be the program as it is, and the only difference is at the register, right? You either have a card or you don't have, and a difference in taxes. And then with 1961, right now, given this language, a few other differences that are all in flux, like how many, how much you could possess, whether or not you have home growth, and so on. And and if we can get all that to match, then uh, I see no problem with getting on board with something like this. But that needs to be the goal. Yeah. So, you know, um, we had, you know, this Facebook conflict earlier today. I feel bad about it because, like I said, I did not intend this to uh, be looked at without the context we're talking about now. With that context, I hope you understand this table. Um, and so the idea is everybody should be paying attention to this legislation, thinking about where there are gaps in 1961, because if it goes forward, we should be communicating what we are concerns to Representative Fetgetter, <clears throat> yes. to Ron Durbin, and to us. Yeah. us. yeah, we all got to stay involved in this. There's absolutely no reason to not be involved in this. We've been doing everything we can to be involved since the beginning. We're going to continue to do that. Um, it's unfortunate some people get a little sideways today. I think we're all going to work our way past it. I think if we can find a way to work together, there's nothing we can't do. As we've seen with some of our conversation here right now, none of this is written in stone. There's been nothing here we've talked about that's worth a fight. Not one thing we've talked about is worth a harsh word with anybody. Every bit of it is worth taking a hard look at and getting involved and letting everybody know what you think and what you want to see in the next program. My concern is that down the road, if there's ever any changes to the medical program, some of us could end up in this program. So therefore, my goal is to make sure this program, as Lawrence has also indicated, is no different other than the tax rate at the register. If that's the end result, 
we're all celebrating together. And that's the goal. You know, when, when 788 got passed, we celebrated, right? All the advocates were, uh, you know, a family. We all celebrated. During, right, during those months of hearings at the legislature, we were all part of a family. We were all working towards the same goal. And then as money started to come in and, you know, as, as people were jockeying for positions of power and influence and so forth, that started to all fall apart. And the, the OCLA wasn't created as, as a way of saying, you know, we want to have more power than others. My idea was it's an alliance. It's sort of just a hub for people to get information and exchange ideas. And so, you know, Fedgetter takes my calls. He'll take pretty much anybody's calls. I want, you know, it's sad that this family feeling is gone. But I'd like to see it back again. And I'd like people to just say before, you know, before we automatically start jumping on each other and thinking the worst of one another, you know, and reading the worst into everything and blaming people that we're all trying to make the world a better place. We're all trying to stop people from going to jail. We're all trying to end the stigma. We're all trying to relieve suffering. We're all trying to help everybody heal right, in their own personal lives and from the, from the trauma of 80 years of prohibition. I, everybody, you know, involved in this discussion, that's who we are. And so, you know, we might disagree about things, but this should be more of a, I don't agree with you, let's have a conversation about it, let's see where each is coming from, as opposed to thinking the worst. Like, maybe, you know, you know today, this be a lesson for us that, that, we should have just had a bit more conversation and we could have stayed friendly all the way through. You know, Lawrence, you mentioned, mentioned um, the OCLA. I want to point out that, or I want to invite everybody to please go to our website, OCLA.org and see how okay, well Lawrence, OKCLA.org, okay, okay, sorry. And see what a great job Lawrence has done at keeping this up to date. You guys want to know our perspective on stuff and, and, and where our motives come from, they're all there. You'll usually find most of these shows updated there if you want to watch these two. But, uh, you know, we put everything there. Lawrence has put the po the link on there now. Check out the website. Um, let us know what you think. You know, maybe we can add more to it. We, we want yeah. everybody involved. There's This isn't about us. This is about everybody. We all need to work together. And, and you know, let me, let me just add that, you know, some people know about my life and other people don't. I've not talked much about my medical issues, but I have serious heart issues. I have serious chronic pain issues. I'm not always at my best. I spend a lot of hours through the day just laying in bed because I'm in so much pain. And so in addition to all of that, as the books indicate, right, I'm a professor. Many of you know this. I'm the director of religious studies at OSU. I'm a professor of philosophy. I do a lot of publishing. And so this isn't, this isn't the center of my life. And I have a passion and a moral commitment to change. But the more people that, that are there to help with all of this, the better. And when I make a mistake, it's not because I'm trying to be a jerk. Of course, I have my bad days, my bad moods. But does somebody let me know that something, you know, that I made a mistake and I will look into it and look to fix it. And I want to let everybody know a week from Monday, we will not be doing a show and we will be taking a little break. I have my eighth spinal surgery, the sixth on my neck on the 1st of February. So I'll be in the hospital for a few days and then uh, it could be a week or two. And then as soon as I can get my big fat brace over here and get in front of the camera, you know, I'll be back on camera. I can't help it. I like it. And best best wishes to Ron Durbin, who's recovering from a heart yes, attack. Yes, of course. See, we're all we've all got health issues. Mm -hmm. Every one of us has health health issues. None of us are going at this with a hundred percent of our strength. We need to help each other, not tear each other apart. Yeah. All right, guys. I think that's it for tonight, Lawrence. We've gone right at an hour, just like we mm -hmm. like to do. Thank you for taking all the time you have to. Uh, go through those bills and explain everything so well tonight. And again, a big shout out to you for the, the incredible job you've done on our website. Every time I go there, I say, wow, I wish I could get more people to see this. So that was mostly written in the middle of the night in bed when I was just laying in bed in pain, you know, I couldn't sleep. I did it on my tablet. I hate to say it, but that, that's how most of it got constructed. So you, so you whip out that amazing stuff with half your brain tied behind your back. We appreciate it, Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
that's it for now. We will find time to do a show. I don't know if it'll be tomorrow night or not, uh, but we'll try and do at least one more show before I'm down for a little while. But until next time, folks, stay grumpy. I'll see you on the road.